Welcome, everyone, to the T Rap Show with your host, Trapper Goldsmith, where we showcase elite athletes and sport individuals with their inspiring stories and rise to glory in their pursuit of everlasting greatness. Today, I'm thrilled to have a special guest who is a true legend in Canadian football. He played in the CFL for over 16 years, earned numerous awards and accolades and was inducted into the Canadian Football Hall of Fame in 2023. He's also a respected broadcaster, analyst, podcaster, commentator, who's covered the sport with CBC, TSN. And for the fans of Winnipeg Blue Bombers, he's an icon and a household name. Yes, of course, I'm talking about Chris Walby. In this episode, we're going to dive deep into Chris' remarkable Hall of Fame career as a football player, a broadcaster, exploring his biggest challenges, triumphs, and lessons learned. We'll also discuss, I think, a little bit of the evolution of CFL over the years, state of the game today, and what the future may hold. But beyond football, we'll get to know Chris as a person, hearing about his passions, interests, values. We'll talk about overcoming adversity, life's challenges, and what motivates him behind that big personality. So, Chris, welcome. Thank you, man. You can call me. You can call me Trapper Wallby because I love that name. <laughs> I, I just think you know what you know. My nickname is Big Bluto, right? I mean, that was named after the Popeye series. You know, big arms and of course chasing olive oil. But you know what? I love the Trapper name. Right? To me, that's just gruff. It's like uh, outdoorsy. It's tough. Uh, you know, if I could go back in time, I'd be ta- I'd be that Trapper Wallby guy. That'd be me, man. Trapper Wallby. That's got a some rapper to Trapper. It, eh? Trapper. Hey, well, I I am manly. I might not be six foot five and and two hundred and eighty pounds, but I uh, I am pretty manly. I'm a, I'm a hunter. I'm an outdoorsy guy. I don't have the beard going. My wife won't let me uh, grow yeah. the beard anymore. But maybe maybe want. I got the hair. Yeah, want, got yeah, I got, brother, the, ha- I got the, the hair. hair. Yeah, I let it grow this way. Right. Well, it's going straight up to God, brother. God bless you. <laughs> awesome. Well, Chris, you grew up in Winnipeg. Now yeah. most pro athletes don't get to come up turn pro, and then get to not only play for their hometown team as a professional, but also win three great cups. Was was that always the dream as a kid? I I think you started out playing hockey. Is that right? Not football? Yeah, hockey was my game. I mean, I still love hockey. I put the skates on a couple years ago at the rink at our cabin and tried to do some skating. And I got four boys, obviously, and, and I got four grandkids now, so it tells you how old I am. But the weirdest thing is, you know, you think you can still do it, right? So I'm putting the skates on. I'm catching every damn crack in the ice. And my <laughs> kids are like, Dad, you really played hockey? I'm yeah. like, yeah, I did, man. They're like, man, you suck. So, I mean, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, you still think you can do it. But, yeah, hockey was the game. Uh, you know, I was very fortunate enough to play uh, junior hockey, junior A hockey, which is a big thing, MJHL out here, uh, for a, a team. That, for, they're defunct now, but they were the Kildona North Stars. And uh, it was just a phenomenal time. I was a close knit bunch of guys. Matter of fact, we just had a reunion uh, a couple weeks ago, and I think we had sixty players from all the years coming show up at a oh, local man. water hole. And just the stories that get swapped. They get bigger. They get better. Um, but obviously, hockey was one of my you know it was a game that I was hoping to continue. I didn't even think about football. I played one year of football, but uh, grade twelve. But hockey it was the dream for me. I mean. Uh, I'll tell you an interesting story. Do you remember a guy named Dougie Smale? No, I don't. Okay, he used to play for Jets. So he played for the Jets. And uh, so Troy, you know, you heard of Troy Westwood. Right. Well, Westwood had a show. He was, uh, he would do TSN, uh, a morning show. And I guess he had talked to um, Dougie Smale. And Dougie Smale had mentioned a comment saying that he actually went to John Ferguson during that time and said, we should bring that Wobby guy up. And... (laughs) I'm, I'm going to tell you why I'm glad he didn't. <clears throat> and it never, it never came to fruition. They brought Jim Kite up, actually, in place, uh, who t- turned out to be a fantastic player. But I guess they were looking for somebody to fight Dave Semenko or go against Dave Semenko. Come on. Come on. And, da- and Dave, you know, was one of the toughest cats in the world, right? Yep. I, mean, I mean, he was Gretzky's, you know, bodyguard. Body, full-time bodyguard. Absolutely. So, I mean, it was that's kind of a crazy story. But, uh, you know, obviously my hockey career kind of ended. I had a... Uh, Got involved in a um, an altercation in a championship game, and uh, you know, long story short, uh, I had to go to went to jail and my equipment. 
Uh, you know, they no arrested way. me basically, yeah, for a brawl on the ice. Um, anyway, it wasn't my, well, I always say it's not my fault. It wasn't my fault. And I'm actually friends with the guy that I got in a scrap with. But having said that, they put us in jail, me and my bro- my buddy. And uh, here we are with everything on ex- except for our skates. <laughs> and they, they let him go and proceeded to try me in a two-day court, uh, you know, court event. So I got charged. Uh, conditional, which is great. Conditional also, but you know, it wasn't a proud moment for my parents or me. Uh, I had a great job with the city of Winnipeg at the time, and then they wanted to get me to quit, so they put me on asphalt crew, and I went through about three pair of boots standing in that heat, you know, the hot asphalt <laughs> every day. But uh, yeah, so anyway, with hockey, it kind of ended. And then I, um, I figured, what am I going to do now? I mean, I was only when I played hockey, I was probably two thirty. How how uh, tall are you? Uh, six seven. So yeah, I was. So you were just a monster on on skates. Yeah, not bad. I could skate. Actually, one thing that, that I was really proud of was I could skate. But uh, you know, I just uh, like I said, I wasn't the focal point of the team at all. I mean, we're talking. I had I had guys that tried out for the Jets and played national in Germany and played around the world. Um, I was just one of the pieces of the of the pie, and uh, just I was really happy just to be part of that uh, the program and the uh, fellowship that I really, really to this day love uh in hockey very cool and i mean i i just did a post on this on motocross so i grew up racing motocross there you go. Uh, that was that was my first passion that was kind of but it never you i mean you you talked about how how hockey is a special place in your heart that first yeah. it's almost like having that first true love right oh, you, God, yeah. you, you move on you get over it right but but it's always it's always there. As, it's always as, there, man. And I would love to do motocross one time, except that when I sat on one of those bikes, it looked like I was giving birth to the bike. <laughs> All you could see was two wheels. So I mean, not a pretty picture for a big man. One of the four fifties looked like a little mini bike. <laughs> oh yeah, I've broken many chairs. That's one of the worst things. I was at a beach party uh, last summer. I sat on somebody's chair, and it just I got I, I thought it could hold me, and I'm about three forty. Um, when I played, when I finished my last year, I was 370. And then I went, yeah, big boy. I'm not, not a, yeah, I mean, I, I probably should have not been that big, but, uh, of course you, you want to lose weight. So they had a contest and I, I know I'm pinballing all over the place right now, but they had a contest <laughs> in the CFL to see who could lose the most weight, uh, with herbal magic, uh, sponsoring us. So they got me to go on and, uh, we had one player from each team. I ended up dropping. 80 pounds come on i went from 270 to 290 and people were coming up to me going hey man sorry man how you doing you okay they thought i was sick with something you know uh because i i became so gaunt so now i'm back to about 330 340 i feel healthy i feel good uh anyway i didn't come in i lost to a guy named jerry detilio who <laughs> lost 90 pounds and i'm thinking he used to be a quarterback in montreal how big was this guy was this guy the same height lying down? I mean, how big was Oh, this my guy? God. Uh, anyway, I didn't win, so. That, but it was it was healthy. I slept better, too, back then, matter of fact. The, was it the ketogenic diet? No, it was a weird diet. It was like one, <laughs> uh, one calcium, uh, one apple, because I guess they told you apples got sugar, simple sugars. Um, you could eat all the meat. It was almost like that one you could eat. You could eat all the meat you wanted. So it was almost like that uh, Atkins Crazy. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I love meat, so I mean, I ate a lot of meat, but uh, yeah, it was cool. But I was exercising a lot more too. You have to get on the bike, and you know, you know, I was lifting weights a lot. So, uh, a combination of everything uh, was good. Um, maybe one day I'll try it again. But yeah, I'm up in the age now. I'm just enjoying life, brother. <laughs> yeah, can't be worried about the, the diets and and stuff. That's right, man. Uh, you, so you played for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers for a lot of years. Yep. What what do you think makes the the Bombers such a special organization, Chris? Well, I and- think it's changed a bit, I'll be honest with you, Trap. Uh, in the beginning, when I played, I played for a guy named Cal Murphy, rest in peace. He, he was my co- head coach and actually GM for pretty much all of my career. And it was a different era back then. It was a tougher era. And I want to say that, you know, with all due respect to the players today. Uh, but... We were not making anywhere near the cash that they're making now. Like, I mean, I saw that one kid, Drew Desjardins, uh, played for the Bombers a couple of years. He went down to the NFL one year, didn't really play, came back, and they gave him a contract for two hundred and fifty grand a year. 
I mean, that's, that's crazy. I mean, I think the most I made was about 85 grand in a year. And, you know, we had to get another job. It was like, you know, we, right. I was teaching. Most was the cool FDL. So that's crazy. But, and then, you know, uh, I just think the organization has really, um, it was, it's changed because back then, uh, it was really a business where the players were just pawns. I hate to say it, but we were, I think mm. the way they've done the bombers now with, uh, you know, Kyle Walters and, uh, Wade Miller and coach O'Shea, they've really created a, a tremendous culture where everybody wants to come play Winnipeg. Now the locker rooms redone. They've got a beautiful weight room. They got professional chefs that cook them meals in the morning and lunch. I mean, we never got that. We'd be lucky if we get some chicken and throw in the middle of the room and, you know, be boys like, hey, you know, and sometimes they weren't even plucked. So are we talking, are we talking about the Cowboys or the Bombers here? The Bombers, baby. Come on. Yeah, <laughs> I, got you. I got you on that one. Nice. No, changed. I, I think that the, uh, I think the organization has done a great job. That's and, good. Uh, they're really great. I mean, look at it. They won two great cups out of the last three. They could have won last year, didn't get that field goal block. They'll be three for three. Um, they've just created, they've created a place where people want to stay and they take pay cuts uh, to stay in an organization where they know. And like Cal Murphy used to say, you may not make a lot of money and you can go and you think the grass is greener on the other side, maybe go sign for another team. But there's two things you got to look at. So if you go to Toronto, your rent's going to be way up too. That's going to cost you more. Secondly, we're going to get in the playoffs every year. So you're going to make playoff money. So that's something you got to, you know, kind of, add up if you want to worry about what you're making so yeah i i don't know man it's a tough question i could ramble for years on that one but i just uh i like the way the bombers are going now but i wouldn't trade what we had you know going two a days and beating the crap out of each other every day <laughs> uh it was a different game i mean I, I was probably one of the biggest objectors when they started to go to this no hitting uh no contact uh right. practicing and they can practice once a week and pass and I used to say, how do I mean for a DB or a you know defensive back, a receiver, these guys, okay, they gotta get covered. They don't really have to have contact. But as an old lineman, you know, if I go into a game and I get beat one on one right away, I'm like, God, I, I need to know that. I need to have the reps. I need to have the physical contact to know how to, you know, re, you know, respond to a move. So I just find it different. But hey, listen, their injuries are down. Right. So I guess there's some uh, you know intelligence to that decision did you ever have any tryouts in the nfl yeah 19 yeah 19 it's funny you say that 1989 i went to four play i had uh gil scott was my agent at the time i only had an agent one year and uh he i just said listen if there's going to be opportunities just take me to a place where they actually want to look at me i don't want to be training camp fodder and uh the interesting thing was i went down to uh, san diego i tried out san diego San Fran, uh, Dallas, and at the time, uh, Phoenix. And uh, I'll say this, it was interesting because in Dallas, uh, I was doing some drills and they have a machine that goes back and forth and then you hit it and you drive it back into place uh, like a big bag, you know, representing a player. And I hear a guy on the hill yell, make him do it again. And I look up at his Jimmy Johnson. I'm like, holy shite, there's that legend in himself, <laughs> right? Anyway, I hit it back. Nothing happened. Mike Shula was making me run the 40 forever. And then uh, San Fran was the only place where I, I did a couple drills. They put me in, you know, cleats to give you a pair of shorts. You take you to the left. You, 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 you pull, run down, hit a bag, go the other way, hit a bag. And uh, the uh, offensive line coach at the time says, uh, you know, that's it. We're good. And I'm like, holy, sh I must have really sucked, man. <laughs> they don't want me. And uh, they actually wanted to offer me a contract that day to come down. And unfortunately, at the time, you know, on a personal level, I was going through a divorce. And uh, I, I had two kids at the time. And I said, well, I really can't do that right now. And he said, well, we can, we can fly you up, uh, you know, during the week, fly you home on the weekends. And it was really? like, really? So I go to San Jose airport and I'm like, man, that's a done deal. And um, needless to say, about three weeks later, four weeks later, I, I haven't heard a thing. And I, he just phones and said, they decided to go in a different direction. So it's interesting what would have happened had I signed that day. I don't know what would right. happen. But, you know, I wouldn't have had my last two kids. Uh, I got four boys. I So I don't, uh, 
Hey, everything um, happens for a reason. Yeah, man, it's it's weird. Eh? Like I said, there's part of me sometimes to think what would happen, uh, especially when you see what the money they're paying these tackles now. I mean, offensive tackles are like premium paid in the NFL. Like now, they're eight million dollars a year. Right. You know, I'm, that's crazy, man. Yeah. But having said, like. I think everything shapes us, right, Chris? I mean, Absolutely. if you hadn't gone through your hockey troubles and maybe you went pro, you got called up, played in the AHL for two years, got hurt, and you, you only had a two-year two, two yeah. year hockey career, right? Like, But that happened. All of a sudden, you turn into a, a Hall of Fame CFL career. I mean, everything happens for a reason. You know what? There's a guy I should bring up, Trap, uh, Trap it's a Ellis Rainsberger was the offensive line coach for the Bombers. When I got drafted in Montreal on the first pick and uh, first round, fourth pick, I was a defensive and a defensive tackle. So when I went to the States, I was in Dickinson State. It was just in the uh, far south corner of uh, North Dakota, right by South Dakota and Montana. Uh, I played defensive line. Uh, I lucked out. I made All-American there. But, you know, and I had scouts come down. I got letters from the NFL. And I thought, this is kind of cool. Uh, and I can't, I got drafted to Montreal, so I got to play with. When I was in Montreal, I was with guys like Vin, Vince Ferragamo, Billy White Shoes Johnson, uh, one of the craziest Samoans I ever met in junior IU. I mean, it was crazy. And uh, Dougie Scott, these guys, I went there. Um, and they were, you know, long story short, they were basically, back then he had a four-man taxi squad. And so what happened was uh, I was on the taxi squad and off the taxi squad. And I didn't even know because uh, they were forging my name off and on. So uh, <laughs> Paul Robson, the GM of the Bombers, phoned my parents and told them and I actually talked to my sister and said, you, you got to tell Chris, he's not even on their roster right now. He's not even on their taxi squad. So they phoned me and I was living in Ile de Sur, um, in right on St. Lawrence Seaway with four guys and just having a great time. Because, you know, anybody, you're young, I'm 23. I'm in Montreal. Yeah. You go downtown, buddy. Nothing even happens to 11 at night. It was <laughs> crazy. I'm a young guy. I'm loving it. So uh, they just phoned me and left me a message and said, if you want to come to Winnipeg, there's a there's a, um, a plane ticket at the airport and we'll pick you up. And I didn't know what to do. I, I had a restless night. And I talked to Timmy Kiss, who was one of my roommates. He's from Winnipeg as well. And he says, go. Go with it, man. Go home. You got a chance. So I came back to Winnipeg and they give me a new contract, whatever. And anyway, Ellis Rainsberger has me doing drills for practice on the offensive line against the starting defense, you know, just to give them looks. Well, next thing I know, I'm wearing a different colored jersey. And he goes, you know what, Chris? I don't think you should be playing D. I think you should be playing O-line. That next year, I started offensive guard. Really? And that was the start of my career as offense alignment. And had it not been for Ellis Rainsberger to say, hey, you need to play this position, I guarantee I probably would have had a two-year career, if that. Uh, so you talk about things happening for a reason, right? That's that's one of those crazy stories where uh, God bless Ellis for recognizing that maybe I could, you know, play, a, uh, be a better football player, better contributor on the offensive line. Incredible. You so you were known for being one of the biggest, toughest uh, offensive linemen. You also had a 16 year career in the CFL. What do you attribute to having such a long, successful career when the average CFL career is is less than five years? Uh, Fear. Fear of getting a real (laughs) job. Uh, You know what? It's funny because I I actually had a teaching degree too, which is cool. So I substitute taught. I think I like almost every year and um it it was it was at that point in my life and uh, one of my best buddies is Stan Mikwas who played 15 years and he's a defensive lineman and we say to ourselves we work out every year we go we got one more year we got one more year what do you think ah yeah we do one more year and we almost got to the point where like we're seeing all our friends working and they got 10 years in a company right now working on a pension and we're like hey we gotta leave this game eventually uh right we gotta get into the real world (laughs) <laughs> uh, and it's funny because when I at the end of my 16th uh, year I blew my ACL which is probably the telling sign and uh, the trainer we had at the time got me in such great shape that I actually was going to come back for a 17th year and then they changed coaches they fired Cal Murphy and everybody and they brought in Jeff Reinbolt on his motorcycle right 
And I don't think Jeff at that time had much respect for me because he was trying, he was, he knew he, he wanted to get a younger guy in there, a cheaper guy. Uh, so it, it didn't work out. And actually at that time, I don't know if you remember a guy by the name of Don Whitman from CBC Sports. Mm, Whitman, Come yeah, on, rings the bell. Yeah, he's a legend. Anyway, he used to do CBC. He was doing CFL on CBC. And he phoned me and said, Chris, we want you to come down to the station here at Winnipeg and do a mock game. Just call the game with me as a uh, color commentator uh, just for, you know, just for fun's sake, and we'll see what happens. And I went, ah, I'm not really interested. I'm going to go back to football. And he said to me, Chris, you know, this window may only open once. You got to take advantage of it. So I went down there and he, he, he turns to me after the mock game. He goes, you need to come into broadcasting. So next thing you know, they're offering me money. I say, no, they offer me more money. I said, damn. Uh, really? I point where I was almost making the same as I was in football. So I wow. said, well, this is a no brainer. So I retired and uh, went to the CBC and, uh, you know, they were great guys too. You're thinking about I was so blessed to work with guys like Chris Cuthbert, uh, you know, who does a great job calling the NHL, um, Mark Lee, uh, just a ton of great people out there. So, yeah, I mean, I've been very, very fortunate and blessed uh, during my uh, my lifetime, really. Good for you. That's awesome, Chris. What? Uh, so how how did your kind of day to day change moving from the field to broadcasting? Because broadcasting isn't. Like you got to have personality. You got to you got to bring energy. Uh, you got to know you know your stuff as well. Oh yeah, you got you got a spreadsheet out there with everything. I could tell you the guy's bowel movements. You know, I was like, hey, yeah, you <laughs> yeah. go between two and three. You know, it was crazy because I was out there, and uh, I'll say this: uh, my first ever game was in Calgary, uh, doing that Calgary Edmonton Eskimo game in that lovely province of Alberta. Yes, sir. And, uh, and before the game, I had a new, you know, you're wearing a suit and tie and the big producer comes over and goes, you're not wearing that tie, are you? I go, why? He goes, oh, it's way too shiny. And I'm like, now my sphincter is even tighter, right? You know. I'm, <laughs> so I go up there and I think, well, and then Don says, don't worry, don't worry. He says, but we got rehearsals. So rehearsals, what I want you to do, you know what, Chris, can you do this? He goes, can you talk about the receivers and the running backs? I'll hit the quarterbacks up. I'll talk about them. And we'll go. So we do the whole rehearsal, three, two, one, do it all. I talk about the running backs and receivers. It's all great. Now we're live. Three, two, one. And Don Whitman says, so, Chris, what do you think about those quarterbacks? And he's <laughs> a freaking curveball. And I start, okay, but I I pull myself out of the, out, out of the, uh, the mind mush I'm in. I get it done, and he says, that is television when you're live. You've got to be able to handle it when things change. It was, was a, a test. Lesson. It was a great lesson. Was I happy at the time? No, but I was like, wow. <laughs> and he said, you got through it. You know, and, uh, you know, that ended up, I, like I said, I did uh, 10 years. And eventually, we lost the contract to TSN. And uh, that was the end of that career. What well, was good, though, because, you know, Trapper, I was doing pharmaceuticals. And I started in pharmaceuticals as a rep. Then I became a district manager, which means I was still running my territory in Winnipeg, but I was now in charge of a territory in Saskatchewan and a territory in Edmonton that I had to mm. work in. And then they, uh, we were in San Francisco meetings, and they turned me into an area manager. So I was national manager of Canada running the nutrition line. So Centrum, Materna, you know, stress tabs. But I had to work with 10 women. All across Canada, they're all dietitians, great ladies, great ladies. But I've never, I don't know any of these ladies, and I've never worked in the nutritional line. I was dealing with Advil, Robax, you know, Dime Tap and stuff. So I had to get really uh, versed in all the, because these dietitians are smart. They're like mini doctors. Yeah. So I got, you know, I can't look like a fool being their boss. So I had to study and go and do all these things. But I will say this: working with ten women. I should have got a award for that because there are some <laughs> tough cats, man. You know, you got, I go, I remember I go out there and I work with women. And they're like, yeah, Chris, I don't feel like I can do work. And I have to fly out. So I'm in BC or I'm in Montreal. And the women would go, you know, I'm not feeling good today. It's like kind of, uh, you know, I'm talking about it. And I go, what? Uh, I'm kind of bloated. I don't feel real good. And I'm like, well, we got, I'm only here for two days. We got to work. 
I never had to deal with those problems with anybody <laughs> else. So you don't deal with that on the on the field. No, so it's really an interesting time. But God bless, it was a fun time, and uh, you know, I did that. I retired in uh, 2012, and uh, then I started doing other stuff. Radio. I did a radio gig for TSN 1290. Uh, I did that for about seven years, and then that ended when we lost the rights uh, to CGOB, which who do a fantastic job covering the football. And then uh, my buddy Darren Bombing said, let's get involved with a podcast. Let's do it. And I was like, wow, this is. And so we've been doing the podcast for a couple of years now. And it's growing. Uh, you all know, as I do, podcasts are, you know, you need, you know, we get, we're looking for sponsors. You know, you're trying to get people to come in. And we're getting some of us. It's growing. So hopefully this year will be another good year. But uh, yeah, it's, it's tell us, great. Tell us a little bit about the podcast. What's the name of it, Chris? It's Bonfire Sports. Bonfire so Sports. Bonfire Sports. Uh, it's called Game Day, and we do a we do a show, an hour show, or about forty five to an hour, uh, the day before every game, uh, specifically covering the Bombers, Winnipeg Blue Bombers. But then we also touch on all the other, uh, you know, the teams that are playing in other games or other stories, significant stories that are you know making waves in the uh, CFL leading up to it. So yeah, it's good, man. It's nice. fun. Uh, I'm a guy that I am lucky enough that I, my wife and I, we like to go to the lake. Uh, I got a cabin about 40 miles out of here with a little waterfront. So, you know, it's nice to just get away and uh, enjoy summers. Because yeah. even when I was doing, you know, CFL, uh, when I played, I had no summers. When I did the CBC, I had no summers. Uh, when I was doing TSN 1290, we'd have to be back all the time in the studio. Uh, now I can do it remotely. So if I'm at the lake and uh, bonfire needs to get a hold of me, I mean I can do it at the lake, set a little right. you know, tripod and and yeah. wax poetic, right? So have your beach umbrella there and beach and umbrella, your, baby. And a cold one. Go. And a cold one. You always have the cold ones off the side. Yeah. Yeah. Chris, playing, podcasting, broadcasting, what's hands down your most memorable game? Well, I think, you know, it's funny. I, normally, I would say winning the first great cup after 20 years in 1984, but it was a game prior to that. It was 1984 playing the BC Lions, who had beat us up pretty good uh, during the season. Uh, we had to play them in BC Place. There were 60,000 people in BC Place. Now, you have to understand, it's so loud that you have to hold hands as an offensive lineman to move on the ball because I'm a tackle. I'm on the far side. I can't see the snap of the ball. I can't hear the signal. So Cal Murphy, a head coach, decides they're going to put little microphones in our helmets, on top of our helmets. <laughs> and Tommy Clements, who was our quarterback, was going to, you know, just talk through that, right? Well, what happens is we get all these helmets. We get them back. They don't fit on our head now because of all the gear. We look like <laughs> kazoo. The helmets are sitting up here. It's not fitting. So now we have to get new helmets for the game, which is really weird because anybody that knows their equipment you feel comfortable in your own equipment. You don't want to be put right. something. The BC Lions, uh, prior to the game, and we're at the stadium um, that Sunday for the West Final, and they slid these little pamphlets under our dressing room lock. Hey, guys, why don't you join us at our victory party after? So, the guys, pin this up. It's, it's you know, it's, it's poster fodder right now. Eh? It's bulletin board fodder. And uh, we went out there and won that game. And I had to play a game that uh, against one of the legendary, toughest guys, fastest guys in James Quick Parker, who had like 26 or 25 sacks during the season. And uh, we ended up doing a good job and coming out of that game victorious. And that was a game, I think I was so crazy euphoric. I was just I don't think I've been happier. Seriously, it was just one of those fantastic memories. The Grey Cup, I hate to say it, the Grey Cup was almost anticlimactic to me. It was nice to win, no doubt. Yeah. To Hamilton and play Dieter Brock, my old teammate. But the get there is the big battle, right? And that's the one that kind of just gets my mojo going. That's cool. That's awesome. Uh, so over, you have a ton of experience in the league, sport, broadcasting. I mean, You've definitely overcome some adversity to achieve what you've achieved, yeah. Chris. What's what's some advice you would give for their athletes, individuals chasing their dream that are going through adversity, that are down and out right now? 
give us give us some tangibles that uh, we can take home on on overcoming adversity. You know, Drew, there's one thing that always stuck on my mind. Don't let people tell you. Don't let somebody else make the decision for you. Mm. And I say that from a from a real uh, honest perspective. When I finished football, or excuse me, hockey, let me correct that. And I tried out for a junior football team. My first year tried out with a junior football team. And I tried out with this team. And, and in junior football, they basically don't cut anybody. Uh, you know, they'll just keep you around. Well, this team cut me. They pulled me aside. And the coach actually told me, he said, you know what, Chris, if I was you, I'd find another profession or some other, some other hobby. Mm-hmm. So here I am. I got a, my, I'm, you know, it's always, you know, here. I'm going with all my buddies. They're driving. I'm in the car with them. They're practicing now. And I got all my gear in a, uh, you know, garbage bag, standing on the sideline, waiting for practice to get over him, you know, just feel like crap because I got to wait for these guys. So I get a ride home. And uh, I use that as such motivation. And I tell people when I speak to them, do not let anybody control your future. You're the only one that can control it. You're the only one that decides whether you want to play that sport, play that piano play guitar whatever it is in your life you got you, you can't be controlled by others because you're always going to have naysayers yeah or always. you're going to have guys that maybe don't want you to succeed they want to bring you down to the level you got to fight through all that adversity be strong be true to yourself and uh you know just keep your dream alive like i mean uh you know they what if somebody said there's uh you know uh, there's always a rainbow after a couple storms so uh, not to be poetic, right? But I mean, that's the way it is. You just got to keep fighting through it. And uh, to me, that was my motivation. Um, and I think that when I talk to other kids in the community center, I do some public speaking. I go to talk at hockey, uh, banquets, football banquets. It's the same thing. Uh, and, and I would say this. Don't worry about where you are today. Worry about where you want to be tomorrow. Because mm-hmm. I was garbage. Listen, I sucked, obviously, for them to come in football. So for me to say that, you know, I mean, obviously I didn't let him control me. Uh, and if I did, and if I believed it, if I took this guy's word for it and I quit, where would I be today? Who knows? Yeah. So, you know what, to me, it's like, uh, you know, you can always, tomorrow's better than today. Just keep working, keep reaching up there, buddy. Don't worry about where you are today. Worry about where you, you want to be want tomorrow. To be. I love it. Yeah. yeah, You need that spark, hey? Eh? I was hey. 17, man. I knew I wanted to be a professional athlete. That was all I wanted to do with my life. And so I chose golf. I actually oh, was yeah. better. I was a way better volleyball player than I was golfer. And uh, track and field, actually, I had a uh, a full ride scholarship offer for track and field. Oh, wow. Right and uh, I'm hitting golf balls at my hometown range. And uh, our, the golf pro who was is coaching me kind of at that time, uh, we're on the range. And I remember I was like, well, I think, like, I think I'm going to pursue golf. And he looks at me, he says, Trapper, I, I don't think golf is for you. You should probably <laughs> think, about, Amen, think about doing something else. Think about getting your business degree uh, and, and pursuing other. And granted, I mean, I didn't have a lot of yeah. potential at that point, but it was that spark that that triggered me. And um, I very well proved him wrong. But I think we all well, we all need that little spark that lights a fire and and us pursuing our dreams yeah listen everybody's got pride uh you want to be the you, just, you want to be uh competitive you want to be at least to be you know in that same avenue like golf i'll be honest with you, you mentioned golf i love golf is it a is it a tough game for a big guy yeah yes. uh, I, I pretty try and you know they always say chris just swing don't have to kill the ball right <laughs> you know you're up there trying to kill the ball all the time and it's you know it's in the bushes every time so uh, yeah, I agree with you 100%. I mean, it's uh, there's things that, like, I mean, I, I mentioned guitar. Well, I've broken all my fingers, right? So every one of my fingers I've broken. So guitar is basically out now because I can't even make a fist. So when I make a fist, I go to the drive through and she gives me my change. It just rolls right out of my hand. <laughs> and I go, I'll leave that for the sweeper. So get it. That's okay. It's, uh, 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 well, yeah, that's it's funny. Crazy. Chris, what do you think? What do you think are some big misconceptions about the CFL? people have well I, I you know i don't know what misconceptions misconceptions have now i mean i think that uh you know we've gone globally now we're bringing in people from around the world to play we've got a couple of guys from japan on the team and in germany we have a german kid that's really doing really well 
Uh, I think the misconception is that we're not a professional NFL type quality team. I know there's a lot of guys saying we should do more to market our game. We should do more to really emphasize that it's Canada's game. And yet I remember being in Toronto uh, when I was working there and I'd be in the watering hole. And I'd be like, Hey guys, put the, put the game on. And they're like, no man, Buffalo's playing, you know, Buffalo bills. Uh, they got such a mentality down there. Um, you know, they, they, well, of course you think about it too, right? They've got the Maple Leafs. They've got the Raptors. They've got the Blue Jays. And I'm just using Toronto as an example. So that's the mentality. And that's, I wish we could get rid of that. Um, but it's up to us and our, and our commissioner, Randy Ambrosi, he's got to be the guy that turns it around and gets people loving this game. Uh, I think it comes down to ownership too, Trapper. I mean, um, mm. BC was one of those, uh, you know, those uh, provinces that we really need to pick up. Uh, you know, tennis was used to be good. Like I mentioned, we had 60,000 in 84. Well, now they've got that new owner and he's doing phenomenal, bringing in bands for pregame, right. you know, yeah. getting uh, buses to the outer, outer uh, areas to bring up, to bring people to the games. Then you got Pinball Clemens who got back involved with Toronto, right? And they win the Great Cup. And that's another major market. They've got to get people going. Montreal, new ownership now. They were, you know, they used to sell out every game when Wetton Hall was the owner. They got to bring that back up. And there's talk about, and they've been talking this since I was playing, about having a team in the, you know, East Coast in Halifax or somebody out there. But I think for me, take care of what we have now, build it as strong as we possibly can. Mm. It's a hundred year old league. Yeah. Let's not, you know, poop on our, on our league. We've got a great league. Brings a lot of players up there. That's another thing that pisses me off, though, too, Trevor. We've had guys come up here from the NFL thinking that this is a cookie league, milk and puppy league, you know, Mickey Mouse league. Well, that's not the case. I had the good fortune of playing the first game against Mark Gastineau, who was a leading sacker for New York Jets in the NFL. And that the, the owner in, in BC brought him up. But he was going out with that Brigida girl that went out with Stan with uh, – what the hell's his name? Uh, the Raw, uh, not Rock, uh, Sylvester Stallone. Yeah. Regina Nielsen. And so I got to play first game and we knocked him. Be Jesus out of that kid. <laughs> and he actually got, I think we taught him respect about the league. Just because you're across the border, not making the same kind of cash. There's quality football players up here. Right. And I think they recognize that. So that's one of the things that used to piss me off. We'd bring these guys in. And they're like, oh, I'm only here for a cup of coffee, boy. I'm black. I'm going to the big show right away. Well, your big show is going to be getting a bus ticket in the Apple. <laughs> I think uh, a good buddy of mine, Jason Vega, he retired with the Bombers. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah he uh So I actually had him on the podcast. We were talking and he was playing, uh, finished his, his collegiate career. And then his agent's trying to find him a spot. And he had a couple of tryouts. And then he was like, well, I actually, there's an opportunity to, to play in Canada. Um, he's like, have you heard of the Canadian football league? And he's like, what, what is that? He had yeah, never he even, never even heard of it. He'd been playing football for almost a decade already. Look at that guy. He's a movie star now doing all, yeah. those, TV, all those car commercials. Yeah, uh, I know. I know he's, he's part of, he's stuff. part of my brokerage actually. Oh, is that right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's a great guy. Yeah, he is. He's actually good, man. But it's also like, so I uh, I remember playing in a tournament down in uh, Fort Worth. And uh, that weekend, we got a tour. A few of us got a tour of the Dallas Cowboys Stadium. Yeah, it's crazy. And it's, and it's nuts, man. Like, there's a Ford dealership in there. It, it's almost like Disneyland destination. Like, they've, yeah. you know, it's just so, so big there. And then the draw. I mean, the population of Texas is the same population as Canada. When you have that kind of of draw yeah. and pick of of athletes, of course, of course, you're going to find some some higher caliber individuals that that come up and play. Well, I think somebody posted something, and I thought it was interesting. And it was a, um, I think it was a kid who used to play. He uh, he actually played with the Washington Redskins, and he played up in Edmonton as a 19 year old. Mike Sellers was his name, and he and they showed that graph again that how many players in the states, how many percentage go to next level how many percentage go to university and how many out of that go to professional it's such a minute amount uh that you know it's just you're really blessed to be able to make it so uh yeah that's crazy man but uh 
I remember playing Mike Sellers. He was expensive end for Edmonton. And then and this is a guy that went to running back and he ended up playing in the NFL for Washington for a number of years, a stud. So crazy. Yeah. What advice, Chris, do you give to an up and coming youngster that wants to have a career in the CFL and chase his dreams of winning a great cup? Well, I don't think we worry about the cup right now. That'd be the, that'd be the Holy grail. I think the biggest thing is right now is take care of yourself. I got a grandson right now. I got two, well, I got four, but the two are in football right now and they won a championship last year. And one is going to be, so I just turned 16 and this, he's going into grade 12 or a senior year this year. And he says to me, big pop, they call me big pop. What do you think? <laughs> I, I go, well, I'll tell you what, first thing, take care of your body. Don't be doing something stupid. Mm. Secondly, which is just as important. You got to get good grades. Like he wants, I mean, he wants to play. There's a lot of people looking at him right now, but he wants to go to the States. And I said, well, you need to have grades. You got to have grades, to get an opportunity. And then I said, just take care of yourself. Don't have to worry about pushing 400 pounds. He's a linebacker type slash rush in. Just, you know, put yourself, get yourself fit, work on your footwork, make sure your speed is good, but make sure you're just doing the right thing. Like don't get caught at a party doing some stupid crap. Uh, you know, that's going to put a, uh, you know, a black mark on your name where they just say, we don't want this guy. He looks like he's trouble. Um, and just go for it. I mean, uh, I'm trying to help this guy uh, as far as, you know, work on footwork. Uh, you don't have to be in a gym, but get a skipping rope. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, you were in track. Um, yeah. You know, I, you know what is funny, Trapper? I threw javelin. And I got to tell you, I was in South Dakota State. First meet ever. And, you know, they teach you kick, 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 pop, and you swing. <laughs> I got the flexibility of a two by four. So, I mean, <laughs> I, I muscle it and I get sixth place. And they give me a trophy. I'm like, and let me just say this. That was the last time I ever, they had guys that were 5'10 that could snap. Yeah. And I mean, I was blown away. I'd look at this and I go, I don't even want to go and throw. I mean, I can't even, I can't even hold this guy's jock strap. This guy is, he's throwing it through the universe. And I'm like, okay, you know, you know, big guy comes up. But back in the school when he had a scholarship, you had to have two sports. So I played football and I thought, well, oh, I'll okay, yeah. So, I threw I so I threw javelin. I won a regional title with oh, javelin. I was the number one ranked BC discus thrower. Uh, and then I would throw shot put because you you wanted to have three, yeah, but yeah, it yeah. wasn't I got a six three a pretty lean. And so when I got my offer uh to go down to the state to Idaho State, they wanted to bring me on for the decathlon because of my build. I could already yeah. throw, but I also had some speed in, in running and uh, so that where you went, where did you go? Ohio State? No, I turned it down to pursue golf. Oh. So I ended up pursuing golf. And at that time I, I was nowhere even near getting a a scholarship for golf. So oh, did you get to, a golf scholarship too? No, no, I had to, I got cut from the university team and, and then had to grind it out, finished my business uh, degree and then turned pro two years out of university. Right on. Good for you. Yeah. Buddy. What's, what's your handy? Uh, now, man, fluctuates. Come on, Chris. It's, it's, uh, what do you, yeah. okay. What do you, okay. What do you, what do you, are you in the 70s, 80s or what? Yeah. Yeah. We keep it in the seventies still. Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Front nine brother. I mean, I still, I still got to take clients out. I got to maintain a, a level of respect, ah, yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, you have, <laughs> so you have a brokerage firm. Yeah, financial yeah. brokerage. Yeah, I got uh, two guys that I play ball with, uh, Milos and Peter Pavic. Uh They were they were with RBC. Now they're with uh, Wellington. Uh, they've been handling me for a while because I tell you what, that's another thing that's uh, interesting is when I was in football. We had a guy who's no longer with us. I don't need to mention him, but he was in charge. He was with investors group. Yeah. And after 16 years, not a word of a lie. My investments didn't make one penny, not a penny. Uh, he just, you know, he took his fees and just, I guess, just played the game. And uh, yeah. so yeah, I, mean, most I, of learned, the time, I learned a hard lesson back then. You know what I mean? Investors Group is a great company. Most of the time, that's an advisor issue, not a not a company. Yeah, well, that's what it was. I mean, that's why yeah. I don't mention the guy. He's no longer with us. So, I mean, that's just the way it was at then. And, uh, you know, it, it sure taught me to be a lot more um, prudent and uh, 
and understand what was going on where before I just trusted. I was a pure trust guy, right? Right. So now I'm a, a different kind of cat. But uh, no, it's well, all and the biggest thing for me, right? I, I think like I so I specialize in athlete portfolios as a previous athlete, and athletes have unique income uh yeah. in in that you don't get paid 12 months out of the year it's exactly. not guaranteed income all of the challenges that come with that and you know i often relate it to if if i wanted to go in for um knee surgery on my acl well i wouldn't just see a general surgeon right i want i want a knee specialist absolutely right and and i don't think your finances should be any different you go in you should have an oh, athlete specialist someone who who knows that and and that's all they do and and specialize in that and I like the fact that the guys that I have right now are doing a very fantastic, oh, they're doing a great job. They keep in contact. Yeah, communication. Uh, I mean, that's the biggest thing. We meet probably four times a year. And, uh, you know, there's, you know, any kind of questions I have. I mean, remember we went in 2000, I think it was, 2008 was the big crazy. Was that the crash? Yeah, 2008. And I think that, uh, you know, a lot of guys were panicking and, you know, like, where's their money? Should I pull it out? And, you know, this guy was like, you know, just hang on, hang on, bite the bull a little bit here. And, uh, you know, it took a while to come back and climb back into, you know, to the right atmosphere again. But, yeah, where some guys may not even understand that. So that's the thing. I mean, uh, I bl I'm lucky to be with a guy that I really trust, which is, is phenomenal. Obviously, you're doing very well for yourself as well. Um, but it's cool, man. Yeah, it's uh, that's a tough it's a tough gig. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm sure you got the graphs going and you got the computers going and it's always like, <laughs> checking, you know, the guys at the end of the day, though. Stuff. Hey, I, I, uh, I was listening to, uh, I think it was an interview you did. And one of the things you said was love people and treat them right. That's right. And at the end of the day, I always say I'm in, I'm in the financial industry, but I really, I'm in the people business. Absolutely. If at the end of the day, the most important part is relationships and, and building that trust. I remember I talked to some kids and I said, you know what? Don't think you're better than anybody. Don't. I said it's not a fast. It's a, you know, it's not a far drop from a penthouse to the outhouse. <laughs> no, seriously, you got to figure it out. And what go? And then the old adage everybody uses: what goes around comes around. How hard is it to give you a smile? Smile at somebody. Shake a hand. How are you doing? Yeah. Good to see you. I'd rather have somebody say he's not. He's a good guy than you know what an egotistical son of a bitch that guy is. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you know, you got to be confident in what you do. I understand that, but you don't have to grind it or make people feel belittle people, put it that way. And I've never been like that. I just, I, I just love, uh, you know, it's like my buddy Stan says, you don't hate anybody. You forgive everybody. I go, I don't forgive everybody. I just don't. It, why would I worry about stuff that really yeah. can't impact me? I mean. Don't have place yeah. in your heart for hate. Yeah, I mean, the only guy I would probably not put a fire out is Trudeau, but other than that. <laughs> uh, I don't want to get a politics because that's I read that every day and I just scream. So that's but, that's a whole whole another that's episode. That's a whole other episode, brother. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, Chris. Well, hey man, I got a I got a ton of respect for you, what you've accomplished hey, on the field, your big personality, your loving nature, and I always appreciate the time athletes take out of their day. I know how busy life gets. I got twins. I got there you go, uh, a full-time career. So taking time out of your day to jump on the show with us, share some insights, some laughs. Uh, really appreciate it, man. And it's, it's great to have you. I appreciate it, Trevor. You be strong, be good, be healthy and happy brother. And we'll talk <laughs> soon. Anytime you want to get a hold of me, give me a call, brother. I love it. All right, man. Take care of yourself. Right on.